Welcome to How Not to DM. I'm your host, Derek. Thanks for joining me on my quest to interview the very best dungeon masters on this plane of existence. Before we get started, I need to shout out my patrons. Thanks a ton for supporting the show and making this all possible. You can also help support the show by sending me a couple of dollars via Coffee or PayPal as a tip, or by making a purchase using my affiliate links. They're all within my link tree in the episode notes. Some of them even come with sweet discounts. I have links from DMs Guild, DriveThruRPG, Hero Forge, Adventure Dice, and 1985 Games. So if you're looking for adventures, minis, dice, or game pieces to help bring your game night to the next level, I've got you covered. Also, take the opportunity to check out the new charity I'm super proud to support, Diversity Saves. They're gathering funds and planning their first round of grants to creators now and need all the help they can get. So if you want to help some underserved creators who are making awesome TTRPG products get their first project up and off the ground and started, consider donating now. Travis Vengroff, creator of Dark Dice, has been telling stories since he was very young and found his niche in incredibly well-produced podcasts. Dark Dice is truly a labor of love, featuring specially composed music from Travis just for the show, professional voice actors, amazing soundscapes, and an immersive story, which is quite different from the standard hero's journey that tabletops generally lean on. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Travis Vengroff. I've been playing D&D since I was in elementary school as a way to entertain myself on a bus. I met someone who said, hey, do you want to play a game? And I said, yeah, what kind of game? And it's like, oh, this is the best kind. You don't need a board. We started playing D&D a long time ago. Eventually, my friend moved two hours away from me, and I wound up becoming the DM of our group of friends to keep everything going. Lasted through middle school, lasted through high school. I had like a lot of games I was running. I think I had like 20 players total, not all at once, in like pockets of five or six. They were all not competing, but they weren't working together all the time. And eventually, some years ago, we had a podcast and we started podcasting and it somehow became our careers, which is lovely and also quite unexpected. And before that took place, but like kind of while we were podcasting, we had this live show we were going to do with this show, The White Vault, which is our horror podcast. My wife writes it. I'm the producer, sound designer, editor, all those things. And we have actors in this live show. We never met anybody. And I thought, what would be a really great icebreaker? Let's play D&D before I have to sit be in a room with all these people and stay in an Airbnb together for like a week. I want to make sure they're not too weird. So let's play D&D. And it was supposed to only be a bonus episode for The White Vault. It was just going to be like, oh yeah, and we played D&D. But it was really fun. And I was able to really creep everybody out. We realized that it maybe could be more than just a single bonus episode. And then it kept going. And now it's a little bit bigger than it was when we originally envisioned it. That's amazing. And uh, I can't think of a better elementary school bus game than D&D. We used to do dumb stuff like try to jump as high as we could when we'd hit bumps to like hit our head on the ceiling, stuff like that. So D&D would have been more productive and probably a lot more fun than that. You mentioned your friend moved away and then you decided you kind of had to start running games. Do you remember what your first game was like and kind of how it was to dive in? And also you mentioned you had a group of about 20 players were they all playing in the same kind of world? And at the same time, was it kind of a West Marches style game, even if you may not have known what that meant? Kind of a two-part question there. But yeah, tell us about running games first, and then we'll dive into the styles later. My friend Julian had this really generic fantasy world, but it was a lot of fun. And we got to play in it, and we sort of built a history in it over time. And when he left, we wanted to continue his fantasy style adventures and... We really didn't have anyone who was going to keep up a coherent plot, let's put it that way, and keep things kind of moving and fun and exciting. How old were you at this point, too? Eight or nine. <laughs> right. You're really hard to put together a coherent plot at that age. And some of it's completely outlandish, and I respect that now, but basically started my own world at that point in time with my group of friends that had played Julian's, and we built it they were able to, I don't want to say like become demigods, but they really did shape the world in some big ways. They got power because a lot of one-on-one -on -one games when you're that little and you're on a bus again for an hour each way to and from school every day. You start getting really deep into these games, even if it's just one or two people who are playing beyond yourself as the DM. And this world kind of grew and more people wanted to be in it. 
and I never really left that world. So it's been one continuous adventure from that place and all the different events that have taken place, some of them completely ridiculous. And adult me looks back on those things and it's like, why did I name this thing that it's incredibly silly. What if I just translated it to Elvish? And then it sounds more like a cool thing because it's an Elven location. Let's just call it that an Elvish. That'll sound so much better. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And unless you've got players who are like scrutinizing or have been around that long and are checking all of your notes with the magnifying glass, they won't care. You can make those kinds of changes. I send them stuff. <laughs> we played in the Darklands recently. I was like, hey, this is your world. We're in it now. And people are going through and having fun. And here's some artwork we've got. And here's some music we've got. And here's where your characters sort of fit in as kind of part of the plot. And they're like, oh my God, you got to use my character. This is amazing. (laughs) Who voiced it? What? It's fun to put those kind of Easter eggs in, especially to kind of pay homage to your past groups and kind of your roots and where you came from. That's really cool. The big question that's on my mind that I want to ask every DM I bring on the show is... What are some of the big mistakes you feel like you've made while running games? They can be specific instances or maybe overarching things. What are some big things you've done that you feel like are mistakes that other people could learn from? Lessons that we can take away. There's one regret I have. No one can really learn anything from it. It's like, oh, I wish I would have let this player end their own life when they thought it was interesting to. It was really thematic. I think that's a lesson to be learned. The bigger lesson for me as a younger DM... I had stories I wanted to tell, and I didn't always pay attention to the stories that people were interested in being a part of and sharing like, okay, you're going somewhere. Your character is from where? Oh, well, I'll just add it to the map. And the city didn't exist. The map has a lot of intentionally blank spots. You're from this location that didn't exist before. Surprise, it exists, and now you're the prince of it. So really giving players a lot more agency in the storytelling and allowing players to really influence the story and knowing what kind of story they're interested in ahead of time allows for a more fun experience for everyone as opposed to one person at the table. And if you can get a general consensus of like, you guys want to run Strahd? Okay, let's run Strahd. Do you guys want to do like a swords and sorcery? Great, let's do that. Spelljammer, cool, let's go to the stars and beyond. Does everyone feel like playing an afterlife campaign of you've all died and that's the start of the story and you're trying to get back Dante's Inferno style? Is that fun for people? So getting a pulse and getting an idea of where people's interests are and including and pandering to those interests I'm not saying like fan service-y, but like, you know that one person really likes puzzles. So stick a puzzle wherever you possibly can every session, at least one, even if the other players don't particularly like them, give everyone a chance to shine and be their best self. So do you feel like those were things you kind of struggled with initially and learned kind of how to do that later on? Talk to us about that kind of growth that you experienced. I was not the best DM at all times, I'll admit. I did learn over time. I also got really bored at points as a DM, as always being the DM and kind of never really getting to be the player very often, you can get stuck in ruts or you can find yourself bored. I had not always listened to my players and just had stories that I wanted to tell because I thought it would be fun. I bored some to tears and I feel really (laughs) bad about that or, you know, overthinking things. You can have a lot more fun if you realize what people are into and they'll be in it to win it. And that's much more engaging than having people bored at your table. 100%. It's a good lesson to learn. And I've experienced all those things. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it takes some pain to grow, right? That's how it is. Can you think of a time when you had a player totally throw a wrench in your plans, in your best laid plans, in your um, hours and hours of prep, and how you had to deal with it, and maybe what happened as a result? It happens so frequently. It's every time I play, actually on Dark Dice, we have Team A and Team B in our second season. Team B is constantly throwing wrenches at me. They have incorrect notes that they've themselves have put on their character sheets and just never fixed. And I keep telling them repeatedly like, no, no, there's no missing children, guys. That's the previous season because they hadn't listened to the previous season when they're playing. Like, no, we got to rescue the missing children. I'm like, there are no missing children. (laughs) So I'm telling I'm the DM. I'm telling you this. Like, you're lying to us because we know you lie to people. Like, ah, I, mm." so every turn they will try and if I say go north, they'll want to go south. If I have this really interesting place to check out, I really have to shoehorn it and seem like I don't want them to go there to trick them to going there. (laughs) (laughs) It's herding cats who actually want to actively thwart you. And I can't think of any specific instance because it's just every single action. Like, do you guys want to investigate the inn? No, no, let's not investigate the inn. Let's check the other (laughs) way. Perhaps there are other ways into the situation and always a bit evil dead about it. 
a while ago, I ran a one shot for my players and they designed new characters for just this one shot. And I pulled the wool over their eyes so badly that kind of after that, they had that attitude, that similar attitude for like a few sessions, like, well, we don't want to do what you're going to tell us to do or like <laughs> the stuff you're putting in front of us because you're just going to trick us again. It does kind of make it fun and interesting. It becomes much more of a chess match than just giving them stuff to engage with that you're kind of describing earlier, right? Like ask them what they're interested in, give them stuff to do that they're interested in. It becomes much more like, well, he's just putting this out there so that we get trapped again. And anyway, it's a funny part of the game, right? Like it, it can be avoided if you just are completely transparent all the time and you never try to trick them. But every once in a while, you got to throw some curveballs to see what happens. So it's just kind of part of it. That's a lot of the fun, too, because you get some of your best moments out of adventures you don't expect. Like, oh, let's spend an episode and go shopping. Like, uh, okay, what are you shopping for? (laughs) Is it on page 150 of the player's handbook? Oh, it's not. You just want to look at cheese. Okay. Hmm. Oh, even better. Yeah. Just something you may or may not know anything about. Like, at least you got stats for some of the stuff they might ask for. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. It constantly happens, though, like you said, whether or not your players think you're trying to trick them. Inevitably, as a DM, you're going to run into a situation where they go one way and you think they're going to go the other, and you just got to deal with it. As far as like favorite moments from your games, maybe really emotional or really funny or really meaningful, um, any that stick out to you, they can be part of Dark Dice, they can be part of your own home games that you've run, anything in between. We had a couple of really great moments in the show Dark Dice that I can think of. We had some really terrible stuff happen. And then I was like, okay, you two players are on watch. What are you guys doing? What are you feeling like is going to happen? And like, oh, we're going to chat while we're sitting around the campfire. Oh, well, that's easy. I, as the DM, just sort of back up and become part of the scenery, as it were, and just do nothing while they talk. Like, oh, what are you talking about? And they just started talking. And 30 minutes later, I realized, oh my God, this is amazing. (laughs) (laughs) They'd gone through this really emotional journey for one of the characters going through their backstory and getting into some parenting issues and familial issues and really stressful things. It was like watching a soap opera and it was beautiful and all the other players just sort of realized like, oh yeah, we forgot we're playing too. Like, this is so nice. I was there, I could have commented, but I didn't want to because it was like I was listening to an audio drama and eating popcorn. It's just a very beautiful moment. We've had a couple Maybe not quite that extreme, but we've had a few moments like that where just the players will take their ideas to a new level that was entirely unexpected. And the story is very much theirs and I have to do nothing because it's just beautiful. They fought the monster and they're just talking about the monster they fought and how terrifying it was for the characters and what they are going through. Will they make it? Will the next one be worse? Can they complete their goals? I think those decompression moments are really important and they are oftentimes my favorite. Uh, Another instance is where I threw a boss at them and I completely whiffed. I won't say if it's for the show or not, but I had eight rolls and my super big bad like Strahd style boss just completely attempting to show a really cool display of power completely whiffed. And then they just look (laughs) foolish and you don't know what to do about it. Uh, That's always a little sad. Those are the times where I'm like, should I start fudging dice? Maybe I should start fudging dice, but I try not to. (laughs) Same. I made like a whole little side story to try and justify why the rolls were bad. <laughs> there you go. Like, well, they were hurt before or something like that. <laughs> yes. It's like, oh, well, you don't understand. Their power was affected by this other thing, which someone else had affected beforehand. And that's why they couldn't do the thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> their powers didn't work that day. <laughs> yeah. We just wreck yeah. on this really quick. The gymnastics you end up having to do, but it's all part of the fun. Exactly. Awesome. Then now let's hear from some of my awesome sponsors. We're going to kick things off with RPG Stress Test. RPG Stress Test is a live play variety show where the Dead Set Media Gang and friends put your favorite RPG systems through the ringer that is their absurd antics. With a wide array of stories ranging from 80s buddy cop movies to heist films, and yes, even The Great British Bake Off, they've surely lampooned something you enjoy dearly. They just wrapped up Season 1, and with Season 2 launching soon, now is the perfect time to join in on the fun. Check them out wherever you listen to podcasts. Or else. That's a little ominous. I guess we better check them out. Next up, Splattered Ink is bringing an awesome new Kickstarter. So check it out. It's called RPG Essentials. They're acrylic creature tokens, a new type of gaming mini, 
featuring hundreds of monsters from classic RPGs. All tokens have at least one variant available, such as different equipment or different colors. They are beautifully illustrated on durable flat acrylic, so they are easy to store and carry, all at a fraction of the price of standard minis. Back today to secure your free Undead Dragon token. As always, the links will be in the episode notes for that. Daryl, who is the mind behind Splattered Ink, is a good friend of mine, did a ton to help me launch my very first Kickstarter, so I'd really appreciate it if you all would take a second to go check that one out. And also, thanks to Hammered Out Homebrew for sponsoring this episode. Hammered Out Homebrew makes homebrew content ranging from items to maps to monsters to all the character options you could want. All of this is building toward the release of Discovery of the Hollowed Isle. This sourcebook details all you would need to run games in this plane hopping magical island with character options galore, monsters, and unique plane touch rules for GMs. Their work also goes alongside Dungeons and Dreadnoughts to have a unique model with D&D rules with a new line of mutated dragonoids just released. Check them out for a mixture of D&D and Warhammer 40,000 vibes. Next up, let's hear from my friends at Vault RPG. Hey GMs, have you ever wanted to show the art for a monster but had to try to cover up the name and the rules with your hand while you were showing it to your players and it just didn't really work? Well, the team at Vault has an answer. Their art-filled sci-fi fantasy TTRPG system puts enemies on cards that slot into the GM screen so the art faces the players and you have all the rules facing you. Better yet, they are on Kickstarter right now, so check out Vault today. Honestly, I'm kind of upset that I didn't think of this idea myself, but props to the Vault team. What an incredible idea to have cards that show the enemy on one side, the rules on the other, and you slot them in so that everyone can see what they're fighting against and you can see the important stuff and run the game properly. Awesome. Check it out. And lastly, a word from my friends at Dude, Where's My Drift? All right. So here's the thing. That drift... The pseudospace plane that's used to travel across pack system of vast and beyond run by Triune. Yeah, that ain't working no more. We got this ship, the Primarata, with this fancy engine that don't work right. Jump the crew all across planes and timelines and alternate realities. And then we got that wild and wacky found family. A lizard, a robot, a brain, a plant, and a slug doctor. Want to know more? Check out Dude, Where's My Drift? All major podcast apps, Twitter and Instagram at DWMD Podcast. New episodes Monday. Whew. Okay, that was a lot of awesome creators we just heard from. Reminder, episode notes is where you can find the links to all of their awesome work. And without further ado, let's jump into this week's edition of Quickfire Chaos. This week on Quickfire Chaos, Travis and I are going to roll on some random D100 tables from the internet to create a scenario to roleplay. The first one is the voice. 57. Short, punctuated bursts. Each word is a beat. Strong enunciation, but fast speech. Oh boy, that's going to be fun. Next one is the job. 15. A Fletcher. For those who don't know, a Fletcher is a person who makes arrows. Next one is the trait. 94. Sarcastic. Okay, amazing. A sarcastic Fletcher who speaks like he's a snare drum. Amazing. The last one I'll have you roll is either a city quest or fetch quest, whichever one sounds more interesting to role play out. Let's see. A Fletcher, let's do a city quest. Ooh. City quest it is. 12. A young boy has a small pouch of copper stolen from him by teenage thugs. I'm going to be a halfling ranger, so short of stature, but brave of heart. Your halfling goes into this Fletcher shop. Inside was an array of arrows, with different types of feathers from all sorts of animals and creatures. The heads of the arrows appeared to have some sort of magic glinting off them, or perhaps poison, maybe a bit of both. Behind the counter was a older gentleman who had weary eyes, but smoking a pipe expectantly as you arrived, he called for you. I've got the next, uh, the next, uh, sh- uh, you know, uh, bag of feathers that, that I've got from all the birds I've been shooting for your for your arrows, and uh, yeah, uh, usual rate I'm assuming. Uh, trade trade some arrows for some for feathers. I can give you copper, but what if I can get you something more? Well, I'm always I got looking a job. For, for- yeah, you, you got a job? I'm always looking for more work. 
What are you here for me? If you're thinking, if you're thinking, I got a job. It's a very easy job. It's a fun job. It's uh, right down your alley. You like hunting, right? Well, yeah, I, I think I'm a quite quite a good hunter if I do so say, say so myself. So you get five copper, f- same rate for your your feathers. What if I can give you two gold for a single easy hunting job? Yeah, uh, what's the quarry? Well, I like you to make short work of them. Uh, it's uh, here's the thing. Uh, I need to verify something about you. You're you're okay with with uh, sentient creatures, yeah? You're okay with with hunting sentient creatures, the most dangerous type of of, of prey. Ah, I see how it is. Uh, if if that's the case, my rate might increase a little bit, friend. But uh, yeah, it's, it's something I'm, I've I've done before. Okay, okay. See, here's the problem. Uh, my boys, they claim that uh, this this other boy stole some a pouch from them. It's a very valuable pouch. Right now, they uh, they 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 claim they were hurt. I didn't see any damage on them. But this this boy, they claimed that uh, it's stolen from him. Uh, apparently, made some threats, and these threats can't stand. So I need him taken out. Oh. Uh, uh, all right. So how how old are you boys? In how old is this boy? Uh, just making sure I, I'm, I'm you know familiar with the details before I accept the job here. Well, they're they're old enough, you know. They're old enough to drink. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I, you you pardon me for for asking, but I just don't want to, you know, be be out there shooting children in the street. Uh, if oh no 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 no! Anyway. You'll be you'll be shooting them at their home. As home, I can give you the address. <laughs> Yeah, thank thank you for the clarification. Yes, yes, uh, I understand. Yeah, uh, I just don't want to be known for murdering children. Uh, oh no, no, anyway. no! He's he's not a normal <laughs> child. You see, um, I I've, I have it under good measure that he's actually a uh, a sorcerer. Oh, he's he's got magic in him, does he? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's that's what my boys were afraid of. You see, he's intimidated them. He took their gold, but from both of them, he took uh, a copper coins, a pouch from from both of them, and uh, threatened to kill him. It's, it's a wizard, uh, evil. Uh, Evil sorcerer wizard. Yeah, the magical yeah, yeah. stuff. Death threats are not to be taken lightly, of course. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, again, I'm not trying to, like, uh, tell you how to parent or, or, or handle matters, but have you tried any other avenues before you've approached me about this? Like, have you talked to the boy's parents or have you talked to the boy? I uh, just... Well, like, according to, to my boys, he turned another one of the kids they knew into a, a frog. I oh, turned okay, okay. So we, I, uh, I, you don't even want to talk to this kid because he's so bad. If you talk to him, he'll make short work of you. you yeah, I see. You, you're afraid for yourself as well. Okay. Uh it does sound like quite a tense situation, and uh, I will. How's this? I will agree to return you the pouches which were stolen. And at the very least, the boy will be uh, intimidated, perhaps driven from town. Uh, I don't want to commit to killing him, but I do want to help you. Okay, okay. Uh, if you talk to him, this boy. Yeah, yeah. The fee is halved. If you retrieve the pouches without talking to him, full yeah. fee. Okay. Is that agreeable? Yeah, I, I think I can agree on that. Um I don't think I have any more questions other than where can I find him and, and what's this fella's name? Ah, okay. Um, Holiday. Uh, his name is Holiday. Uh, Folk eye Holiday. Um, it's, it's the eye. He's got he's got two different color eyes. Uh, he's uh, a human, very scary human, uh, located on the far side of town, and it's going to be a barn next to the inn known as the uh, Golden Brass Cat. Golden Brass Cat. Right. Okay. For- Fork Eye Holiday. I'm-, I'm writing this down. Fork Eye Holiday. Golden Gold Brass, brass cat. cat. Yeah. Brass Cat. cat. And, uh, right. Okay. Well, friend, uh, I'll go see what thing. I can it's, do it's about it's this. It's very important you don't talk to him. Just either you shoot him from afar or get the things that being seen and get out. Whatever you do, your way. But don't don't talk to him. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, don't be I'll seen. See what I can do, mate. Don't don't be seen. Yeah, that's one of the specialties of mine. All right. I'll see what I can do, mate. Uh, 
and I'll get back to you about this. If he sees you, he could like turn you into a hawk or something, maybe. Right. Or right. sick sick hawks on you because I th- I can control animals. Maybe. I jeez, his, his power grows by the minute. Uh, all right, I, I'll, I'll I'll be uh, I'll be most cautious, and I'll I'll get back to you, mate. Safe travel. So thank you for the feathers. Here's your coins. Cheers. He's going to kind of walk out of the door and uh, he's very unsure about this job he's just been sent to do. <laughs> You've been sent to kill a young boy who's already been robbed. <laughs> right. What in the world? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Don't talk to him. Don't talk to him. Whatever you do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. Nothing bad could come of this. <laughs> Absolutely. I love not. it though. The world is full of skeevy people, you know? And so your fantasy worlds probably are full of them too. Tell us about Dark Dice and tell us about how it's been going. Again, it wasn't really supposed to be a real thing, but I listened to the audio files we had. We recorded the entire show, season one, in like two weekends. We did like eight hour days for two days and then two more days. And by then, everyone was either dead or we completed the quest. (laughs) Spoiler alert. Yeah. (laughs) Amazing. That's in our title. Our description of the show is as people die, they're replaced by the doppelganger and get to play the doppelganger. And it's quite fun. It sounded really good. I also got a little bit obsessive. It was at a particular time in my life where I needed something to focus on. And when we started releasing these things, it kind of blew up a bit bigger than our previous TTRPG show that we'd done, Liberty Vigilance, which was really good, but got almost no traction. It's our most unpopular show to date, but it was a lot of fun. Ashley Birch was a player at one point. A lot of voice actors from TV shows and stuff were on it. Space Ghost, Duke Nukem, etc. But completely obscure. <laughs> that was a ridiculously fun show to make. So I wanted to do more of that. So as we started getting into the Dark Dice stuff, it really clicked rather well. And I kept having more fun with it. After we finished our season one campaign, I felt there were some unresolved story arcs that I kind of wanted to get into. So we started a second season. We started recording the second season before we even released the first one. And one thing led to another. And now we're working on other stories too, which are equally exciting in the same universe. That's awesome. If you were living under a rock, then you may not have heard. But the second season of Dark Dice has a really amazing guest that you were able to land to help voice one of your characters. So I'd love to know how you pulled that off. (laughs) Sure. I mean, if you already were getting people like Ashley Birch, I guess you must have some pull in the industry. But yeah, I'd love to hear the story. Actually, zero pull for Ashley. Ash's friend was on our show and was just kind of like, oh, do you want to do something fun? Yeah, sure. It was before Critical Role took off in a big way. (laughs) But for this person, I've been playing D&D at home a lot. Before COVID, we were playing a lot of home games in our friend's basement. And in his basement, there's this pillow of Jeff Goldblum. And I'm like, oh yeah, of course, Jeff's one of our players. You're like, ha 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 ha, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's so awesome. <laughs> so we're like, well, what if that's kind of a good idea? What if? So I wrote a very nice letter and made a character sheet and put the character sheet with the letter and included some- A article. letter, not an email. It was an email. My handwriting is completely illegible. So we had an email <laughs> drafted- there's always been a lot of art really closely tied with Dark Dice. I've been working with a lot of amazing artists. Marcel Mercado, who did the piece of Jeff Goldblum as an elf, we included that with the pitch. And there was never a no. And every turn, I'm like, okay, we're this obscure podcast. If you look at actual podcasts that are successful, we are not that. We are definitely not that. Dark Dice has never been that. And emailed him, didn't care about that. And then we kept getting no no's. And then eventually it was just, okay, what are you doing next Thursday? Like, eh? <laughs> so the back and forth was just like answering questions mostly. Like you said, if there wasn't a no, was that yeah. kind of what the communication was? Yeah, okay. There were clarifiers. So to speak to someone who is legitimately famous, they have agents and they've got managers and different groups of people that you have to speak with. And you share these things with their talent. But then they have questions because they want to make sure that they're not exposing their talent to someone potentially detrimental to their talent's career. Right. Or unprofessional or whatever it could be. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we checked all boxes for that. Jeff had a lot of interest in us because of the projects we've released. We have a really good reputation in the audio drama industry or space. We have done a lot of cool things there. The music for Dark Dice is particularly good and he's a musician. I believe that may have helped in a big way. The fact that it's improvised and you can really put a lot of yourself into the show. 
it was a lot of fun working with Jeff and he's amazing. He was more excited to work with us in some ways. I was surprised because he knew us and it's like, oh, where's Caitlin? Was she not playing with us? I'm like, oh no, she's behind the door right now because she's embarrassed to admit that she's actually here because she's not in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was really fun. And we had some tech issues. So I was like, okay, while we're doing this, I'm going to sing a woodcutting song. Okay, who's with me? Let's parlor this. So we have an Elvin woodcutting song in our episode. He recorded some stuff for our Dark Dice musical. Again, like the ridiculousness and the fun was entirely unexpected. How long ago was this? Had he finished his work with the latest Jurassic Park movie at this point? It was before it was done. It was before. Nice. It's not like he's not a busy person, but he specifically said, this sounds fun, made time and was excited to work with you. I mean, as a creator, like I can't imagine there's any better feeling than that, right? It was incredible. And then when we announced it, this huge amount of press and we had our PR department, aka myself and my wife, nonstop emails and like messages on Twitter and Facebook and all our social medias, which are very few, four social medias and all the emails. And we're literally on it for about 70 hours nonstop with no sleep just to try and keep up with people. We want to interview you here. We want to interview you here. We think you're from Hollywood and you're taking over the D&D scene. I'm like, look, bro, I lost friends during the satanic panic because all of a sudden they thought D&D was evil in our schoolyard and they like told people not to hang out with me. I lost friends because they couldn't hang out with the guy who played D&D. And I'm not from Hollywood. I'm, I was recording in my mother-in-law's sewing closet. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Wow. 70 hours straight of dealing with PR stuff. I'm sure that was fun. It was intense. Yeah, intense is probably a better word for it. <laughs> Man, I remember seeing articles everywhere. So, I mean, for what it's worth, you did your job. There was tons of people were covering it. The PR thing is really less about, for us, it was less about, I have to reply to every email and things. And it was more about if people are starting to spin this negatively, that we like get the correct information out there really quickly. Like, we're not from Hollywood. This isn't us spending billions of dollars to make a new D&D podcast. We've actually been around for more than two years. You just haven't heard about us. Because <laughs> we're <obscure. laughs> Right. Yeah. Oh, man. It does sound interesting. I recently had my first taste of PR stuff when I was promoting my Kickstarter, which you helped us with. It was interesting. I was like, how to write a press release? You know, like I'm Googling this stuff and just like figuring it out myself. So yeah, I'm sure that was a ton of fun. That's a, an amazing story. And I can't wait to get to that point in the show and hear him sing an elf woodcutting song. That's going to be incredible. Now I'm even more excited. I'm going to have to start listening as soon as we get off here. What are some of the big differences for you in creating this show versus running your home games that you were doing previously? For instance, for the listeners who are unfamiliar, it's a very highly edited and curated experience, right? You kind of skip a lot of the, or not a lot, a fair amount of the table talk and the rules discussions and stuff. And it's much more in kind of the audio drama vein where you've got a narrator, you've got a story being told. When you are creating this, yeah, what are the big differences that you've got to deal with? It's a two-part answer. Part one, I edit the show. It's the actual audio from our actual games. I've just cut stuff out for the most part. Adding and editing very little into what you're hearing, it's mostly just swapping my voice out as an NPC because I don't like my voice. And I think other people can do much better jobs at being these characters. And that's fine and lovely. And the other huge change we make is if I give a character a giant stat block of text or a description, We'll have them just go back and re-record a couple of lines. So it's not me describing a room. It's them saying, oh, do you smell that? Yeah, I think that's sulfur. Oh, does anyone have a torch? Instead of me stating, it is a dark room. It smells of sulfur. <laughs> you need a torch. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a huge thing either. That's like out of an hour of an episode, it's less than five minutes of your content. And then also the other huge change we make is combat. Just straight up saying combat is the worst part of every TTRPG I listen to. It's not fun. You're hearing a lot of redundant information. What if we could just have it described very quickly, rapid fire with nothing in between? The player says, I do this thing. But instead of saying that, I'm just going to describe exactly as they said it, but in a third person narrative. But it's the same lines they gave me, which sometimes can be really goofy and awkward to say. Like, oh, I hit the guy and his head goes up backwards and bounces off the wall. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's what we've got happening. It's bouncing off the wall. And the head bounced off the wall with a little bit of a smirk there, thud, and all the sound effects get added. But really, it cuts an episode that would be two hours down to an hour 10, because combat is just so slow and can be very painful. That's the biggest difference editorially from what you're hearing to the actual game, then reiterating the differences of play style. 
Dark Dice is created for the audience's entertainment, not for the player's entertainment. That is a huge difference. The actors, I call them actors, my friends are there to be playing their characters for the purposes of partly to have fun, because it is fun, but largely to entertain. If they do something and play to a character flaw incredibly strongly, if there are instances of self-harm or self-sabotage or really embracing some of the darker things that I give them as prompts, it's awesome. And we want to encourage it. If the entire party gets total party killed, oh my gosh, that's great. I'm going to cheer because it's going to be a really great part of the story. Everyone's going to remember that forever as the day everyone in the party dies <laughs> and the <Yeah>. campaign <laughs> ended. And then I have to figure out how to pick up the pieces with the next group. It's a different mindset than... We're here to play a game. We're here to empower players to have a great time while also making them feel good. And part of that is empowerment. So they have moments where they're not just terrified and scared and stressed all the time, but they have victories and giving them the victories that are important to them and their characters and the players, particularly. It's a different audience. It is. Um, I agree with you that combat definitely is the least interesting part of actual plays, and it's tough to kind of find a good way to push through it. Which is interesting because I feel like in my own games, that's the part that my players anyway enjoy the most is like the tactical part. And don't get me wrong, they like the story, they like the role play. But as a listener, you're not playing it. So it's... It's different, right? You're not the one making the decisions and you get what I'm saying. I 100% feel that. You mentioned that music is a, a big part of Dark Dice and a unique part of the show itself. You yourself have a background in music and have made some of the music for the show. You've directed some of the music for the show. You've got other friends and composers you work with as well. Tell us a little bit about why that was such an important part for you to add into the show and maybe some of the fun or interesting stuff you've gotten to do or put into the show that you're proud of. The reason there's such a big emphasis on the music is because I needed the distraction. I was a pretty bad time in my life when I really needed to focus on something and that was a really great thing. I had this hurdy-gurdy piece that I just kept making better and better and bigger and bigger. There's a song for this shapeshifter. And every time you hear it, you're like, oh, snap, something bad's going to happen. This is going to be terrible. The silent one is near. And having these cool cues was fun. And I wanted to take it further and further. Gradually, I asked more and more people I knew if they would be open to working with me on building this soundtrack. Because stock music is cool, but there's not a whole lot of hurdy-gurdy stock music. I wanted a lot of hammer dulcimers. I wanted a lot of hurdy-gurdy. I play accordion, so I can do a little bit of accordion in places to kind of fill in. But I wanted that medieval feel, and I wanted it to be dark and creepy and fun and freaky. So as I started asking these questions and meeting more people, more opportunities opened up. And eventually, we started working with people like Hitoshi Sakamoto, who's worked on Final Fantasy Tactics and Tactics Ogre. And we also have David Wise now working on next year's soundtrack from Donkey Kong Country, David Wise, very talented composer. We've got some really chilling themes that I'm just excited to share. Again, all this music for the world, we've released tracks that aren't even on the podcast because I'm trying to also build a world and release a bunch of pen and paper based stuff so you could play in our world. Or you can try out the adventure at your own home, even if you're kind of new at DMing. So it's one part player aid, one part prompts for people, one part pure entertainment, and then also one part world building because the lyrics tell stories in Infernal or German or Icelandic or Draconic, whatever language we're picking for the day. You had actual choirs learn songs in these languages too, right? And recorded songs. That was an incredible thing for me to read. I don't remember where I read it, but yeah. The streams are still on our Instagram page. You can see me grinning from ear to ear in Budapest, trying to get them through these really tough parts. I'm trying to say them really slowly and then they just like rapid fire through it because they're much better at singing and also at learning new words and syllables very quickly. Right. If you're singing, you're singing in all sorts of languages. My wife, she did some opera training and so she, you know, she can like phonetically read a few different languages even though she has no idea what it says. Exactly. And it's such an amazing talent. I don't have it, but I'm, I'm very lucky that I get to work with these people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A very cool... Um, piece for me to just as a fan, you know, listening and knowing all of the work that has gone into all of the different layers. Yeah, it's really fun to hear the themes popping up and catch on to that kind of stuff. You mentioned you've got a few other things that you want to do with Dark Dice, maybe working on letting other people play in the world, producing more music. Do you feel like there's more stuff that you want to get to that you haven't already that are kind of on your Dark Dice to-do list? And then do you have any plans after you've kind of done what you want to do with Dark Dice? Do you have plans for what you want to work on next? A couple things here. So we're doing a lot. 
I think the things that I'm actively doing are the things that I want to do next. If we got a TV deal, that would be interesting. I don't know how that would work. I still like keep envisioning this like, okay, so is it like a critical role or is it like a Harmon quest? I don't know. And is there room for another critical role? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there doesn't need to be. Maybe we could just stay a podcast forever. I love that. I love what we're doing. It doesn't necessarily have to change. We are releasing, and we've always released PDFs of campaign adventures and classes. We have a true necromancer class, which is devious, but also really balanced and also a very much of a team player for parties, not just them and the undead. It's them, the undead, and the party. We're working on two, like a puzzle-based adventure, like a dwarven heist under a masquerade. And then we're also working on a prison break adventure and some other ones that I can't talk about as well. We've also released some soundtracks and releasing more music. We've got Season of the All Shadow, which just came out this year, and we have over an hour of additional music that we haven't even shared that we're just anticipating and excited about because it hasn't come up yet in the story of our podcast. And I don't want to preemptively release all this music and then like not have the cool reveals. There are other things we're working on. I've got a world book that is in a very early alpha, which is available on our Patreon page with a lot, a lot, a lot of artwork. I've been really tooling the world, working with a lot of people to make sure that it's a more diverse world than I would be capable of creating myself. And that has been a lot of fun. And it's been about two years of work. We're only still scratching the surface, though, of what we'd like to do with it and get that out there. But that's probably the next huge thing for me is getting the world book up and out. Besides, whatever our next adventure is. And as far as Dark Dice, after Dark Dice. Dark Dice is actually my in-between show. We release it once a month in between while I'm making other shows. So I don't see an after dark dice for me because it's just always going to be kind of running. If we finish the current campaign, I'll start another one. Roll new characters and take them to another horrible place from which there may be no return. And perhaps one or two of them may just make it out. I love it. So dark fantasy, everyone who likes fantasy will have noticed that it continues to grow as a genre, right? Game of Thrones and The Witcher and these are popular shows or video games, that kind of thing. There's a lot of books and movies and shows being created every day that kind of explore this genre. So why do you think dark fantasy continues to grow? And why do you think people like it so much? And what do you enjoy about it so much that led you to create this world? I feel that dark fantasy is a fun place to be as a creative. It allows you to have high stakes. It allows you to really care about characters and put them in real danger which means you could potentially lose them. So every interaction they have that's really sweet is much more sweet because not every interaction is generally sweet. So when you have a moment where a Stark and a Hound sit at a table and eat chicken, regardless of the circumstances around it and sort of the terrible stuff happening, they're having some really real moments and you can smile. And before things go wrong again, you can really enjoy being there with them, eating chicken, just kind of chatting and being carefree. And it feels so nice before the weight of the world comes back or is removed a bit again. As a genre, that's a really cool escapism-like thing for me. I find myself drawn to it a lot. I like really dark literature, movies, TV, and then again, those moments. There's a date scene in Blade Runner, the sequel, and that date scene is so wonderful. It makes you think so many complex questions like, okay, well, there's some ethical things going on here, but okay, let's forget those. This is also a nice moment for these characters in a very complex and painful world where not many nice things happen. And it makes those moments so much more gratifying at times. Yeah, the levity really contrasts well in those kind of genres, I agree. And when you're describing like the example from Game of Thrones and Blade Runner, I was like, oh yeah, those are great examples of exactly that. That's awesome. You can also ball your eyes out with them at times. <laughs> <laughs> you can. As I'm getting older, I'm more prone to tearing up from ridiculous things that I see that used to not bother me in my jaded mid 20s, you know? <laughs> so funny how that goes. The last question here I love to ask people what some of the best advice they've heard or have kind of formulated themselves about running games and then maybe also in your instance about audio or music or creating content in general. Any advice that you've got to people out there who are trying to start or have started either one of those tasks and want to keep getting better at them? I would always advise trying out and playing book campaigns or PDF campaigns that you find online at like DM Skilled. Like Wild Sheep Chase, really easy and a lot of fun to run. You can't go wrong with Wild Sheep Chase by Winghorn Press. 
If you want to try like a Tomb of Crossed Words, if you're like a real puzzle person, that's another great one. If you want to try Curse of Strahd, that is a really cool horror campaign that is really well written. It's a book. It's done Domain of the Nameless God we have and released. It's a uh, platinum bestseller. People really like it. I'm a little biased that one though. But there are many adventures you can read. And by reading adventures, it'll help you form your own. And it'll help you also format your own adventures in a way that might be easier. Like in reading Wildmont, I learned a lot about how to format world building lore and format locations and format factions. And how do you classify this? Oh, they did a really great job here. I was reading Drakenheim, and Drakenheim is another just fun adventure that has I've come got out it on recently. my bookshelf. Yeah, it's amazing. It's so well written and everything. The coherency of colors they use, it's very inspirational. Everything's that purple. So the more you read, the more powerful you become as a storyteller, the more you can kind of say, well, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. If you can use a spell like that, why couldn't you use a spell like that? Or maybe I don't like that. So let's omit this and let's make it this way. But you can create your own decisions by seeing what others have done. And the other piece of advice I would give you is if you're like me and are terrible at coming up with things in the spot, which I can be at times pre-write descriptions. They can be a lot scarier if you have time to think them up. And the more adjectives and the more you describe things, the creepier it can be. You don't have to be limited to sight. You can add sounds. You can add smells. Smells are very visceral for people too. You don't even have to smell them, but you can write about them. Think about handouts you can give players. Those are fun. But the more you can prep and the more time you kind of put into it on the front end, if your players skip it, that's unfortunate, but you can recycle it later. You have the option to use it or not. And I put way too much prep into our games because I feel quality is better than quantity when it comes to such things. But at least for important descriptions, for like you're about to do your huge villain reveal, consider writing something down or jotting a couple notes ahead of time to make it as cool as you want. Yeah, then you're not kicking yourself later for missing out on details or not making it as epic as you wanted to. Exactly. Thanks so much for joining uh, me, Travis. It's been a ton of fun. I've had a few guests on previously who've mentioned your show as an inspiration. Most recently, I had Zach on from Warlock and Severed Sons who mentioned your show specifically as an inspiration for his audio drama, Warlock, which is really cool. People are out there making stuff because they really like your stuff and find you as an inspiration. So that's amazing. Where can people find you on the internet? Where can they find your work? And do you have anything coming up events or things that are dropping soon that you can tell us about? First of all, you can find me at Dark Dice Pod on all social medias. You can find our stuff also at darkdice.com. We've got all the things. They're a lot of fun and almost all of it's free. So please enjoy it. We are fully funded by fans. So if you like our stuff, patreon.com slash fool and scholar, we make a bunch of scary fiction and even some fantasy stuff for all ages like The Boar Knight, which is an all ages children's musical about a boar who's a knight who's bitten by a man. I'm also Ven, V-E-N, Travis on Twitter. If Twitter's still even around then, I'm there. I'll be on that ship for as long as it's there. Other things, future stuff that we're working on, we'll probably be talking about an album release at some point around January. It'll be exciting. We'll also be announcing, if we have not by now, we will be having weekly releases of Dark Dice starting in May for a period of time lasting until October. So we'll either be weekly or every other week, depending how quickly I can edit and how many hours of sleep I require on a regular basis. But it'll be more than monthly, and that's important for everybody. It'll be our main show. So hope you're all excited for that. Dark Dice Summer. Yeah. Also, we will be at London Comic Con in May. So hope to see some of you there. And we will also be at d and Castle in March and November. Woo-hoo. So England, three times, one year. Are you going to be running games there? Yeah. We're playtesting our newest story with some unfortunate adventurers who are excited to be there for some reason. <laughs> nice. That sounds so cool. I watch from afar on all the D&D in a castle announcements and people who go play. One of these days, I may decide that that's what I'm going to spend my hard-earned dollars on, and I will go and I will enjoy it so much. We were there in November. It's a lot of fun. Amazing. Thanks so much for joining me, Travis. I know it is getting later for you in the day. So I appreciate you taking time and uh, joining me all the way from across the sea. And I'm really excited to see what 2023 brings for Dark Dice. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day over there. Eight time zones away. (laughs) Thank you for listening to How Not to DM. 
now it's time for a sneak peek into next week's guest, Michael Lowe, game designer behind Star Sworn, a story-driven RPG created to help kids learn more effectively. The roots of gaming are often in war games, right? Everybody learned right. on things like D&D, where winning was the issue. If story is the issue, then it gives you a much different incentive. You get to stop and be like, awesome, we're telling a dope story. What would be amazing here? How do we link this back to some cool, you know, some of the cool threads everybody's got going? Okay, what's behind the door? Like, let's go. You open the door. You tell me what you see. Those are the moments that really turn it back into this wonderful communicating, collaborative, community building experiment that really helps people learn to write and create together. To hear more about Michael's philosophies behind the games he designs, about his various ambitious projects, and advice on running games for any group, no matter the age, tune in next week. Quick reminder here to check out Diversity Saves if you've got a second to see what they're all about and to find a way to support them if you can. Here's a friendly reminder to rate and review the show and share it with friends and family who play TTRPGs too. New reviews will be read at the end of episodes as a thank you. Thanks to the team at T4C Studios for the help editing and producing this episode. My intro and outro music is by Daniel Zombo. The Quickfire Chaos music is by Exacat, and the Quickfire Chaos mood music that plays underneath while we're roleplaying is by my buddy Arcane Anthems. Check out the episode notes for more of their great work. And, as always, until next time, roll some Nat 20s for me.